Hi, I'm John. I have an undergrad in aerospace engineering and I've got a, an MBA and many, many failed startups under my belt. Uh, but in the academic theory of blind squirrels and nuts, I actually found one and had a successful exit to the Boeing company in the year 2015. And I'm fortunate enough to now be on stage talking to you about something that, uh, that I'm really passionate about. You know, one of the coolest things about joining the Boeing company is, you know, there's a lot of pilots. And uh, you've probably heard the joke, you know how you can tell the pilot in the room? Don't worry, they'll tell you. <laughs> so I'm a pilot and a father. And one of the things that uh, is really fascinating about what we work on is that, I'll just give you a stat. Um, most of us, 95% of us, when we have to take a trip of 500 miles or less, we drive, right? Well, this is my son flying in a Cessna one day just for fun in Southern California. And, you know, you wonder, why don't we fly more? Well, I firmly believe that in his lifetime, he will. But it won't be him at the controls. Um, there might be somebody up there with some epaulets on the shoulder to make everybody feel comfortable and safe. But for the most part, the airplane's probably going to be doing all the hard work. So today, I'm an executive in the Boeing company working on the future of mobility. This is how we see it, right? And this isn't just an artist's you know, rendering the 3D isometric drawing that everybody and every startup pitch deck in the world seems to have these days, Silicon Valley style. Um, this actually means something. So each one of the icons that you see on this chart is a capability that will need to exist. Um, some already exist, some don't exist at all. Some exist and need to be improved in significant ways to make this future of mobility real. Each one of the dashed lines represents a use case that aviation can help solve. So today what I'm going to do is share with you a little bit about the problem of airspace management given that previous view I just showed you. To make all those use cases happen, the scale and the volume of air traffic is going to increase exponentially. But let's talk about how it works today. This is a simple workflow diagram, using some pretty cool images, of a typical flight. So we'll call her Lisa. She's starting, and pre-flight, she does her flight plan, and she shows up at the airport, pre-flights her aircraft, gets in the cockpit, and the first thing she does, and typically before you even start the engine, is call up some air traffic controller and request your clearance. That's a radio communication. Uh, the controller looks up uh, the pre-filed flight plan and reviews some other aspects about airspace and congestion and weather, and then reads back either the clearance as it was requested by Lisa or uh, with some changes. From there, she'll talk to a ground controller who sits in the tower, typically up in the tower cab looking down at the, at the airport environment, and give her taxi clearances to a place where she'll get you know, her final preps before takeoff. And then she'll talk to what we call a local controller, which is your typical tower controller, looking out the window telling people when they can take off and land. From there, uh, after takeoff, she'll be handed off to a departure controller. Uh, that's the typical air traffic controller. If any of you ever saw the movie Pushing Tin, that's where they sit. It's an area called Tracon. And they will give you vectors to your cruising altitude and hopefully you hear those magic words cleared as filed or pilot's discretion. We love that stuff. That means we can just point directly where we want to go and save some time because there's no bathrooms in our airplanes. Uh, from there, you talk to a center controller um, who's typically just making sure flow across the country is happening the right way and sequenced properly given the target airports that you're going to. And then you come back down the other side of the hill, back into a Tracon that's now handling your descent from cruise into your approach and final approach segments of your flight. And then to the tower controller again who gives you a clearance to land. Uh, and then you taxi to parking and you say, right on, time for the $300 hamburger. Uh, without dating myself too much, it used to be called the $100 hamburger when I learned to fly, and now it's a much more expensive hamburger with Wagyu and other stuff. So on a typical flight, even that little example I just gave you of Lisa going flying, there are literally hundreds of pilot controller voice interactions, right? Um, you know, back to natural language processing and some of the things we heard about this morning, you know, there's a language to this, but they use the equivalent of this, right? It is a simplex two-way radio Circa 1930s, eh, much cooler plastic and power and all kinds of stuff today. But at the end of the day, it's a simplex radio. And for those of you who don't know what that means, simplex radio means only one person can talk at a time. If two people try to talk at the same time, they step on each other and they squelch. And you hear a really awful feedback kind of noise and nobody understands anything that anybody said. So that's a challenge. On the controller side, this is what they're looking at. Uh, yeah. Okay, most games I play on my phone have better user interfaces than this. Uh, and people are actually controlling, you know, scores of aircraft at a time uh, looking at this kind of display. 
So what does the airspace look like, right? What's the problem set we're trying to solve? Check it out. On any day in the United States of America, there are 44,000 flights. This is just the airline flights. This is just the flights that have filed IFR flight plans and are actively working in the air traffic control system. In addition to this, there's myriad of general aviation flights, um, and they're all in the airspace, and they have to share it together. Pretty amazing. Uh, it's an amazing system. It actually works really, really well. Um, com very efficient, uh, you know, born of decades of, you know, scale uh, and iterations. But it is also quite fragile. Uh, one storm in Chicago can create shock that reverberates through the system to create gate delays in Miami, ground holds at all kinds of different airports, and then for the airplanes that are in the air, rerouting to airports that they didn't expect to go to. Uh, I have certainly felt this pain many times coming through Chicago and realized that if you didn't call the hotel from the plane on the tarmac, you're sleeping in the terminal that night. On top of that, passenger travel is expected to double in the next 15 years. So we're going to go from this to this. On top of that, we've got some new players in the business. This whole world of unmanned, right? Drones. And not just drones, you know, like the small hobby drones that we're thinking about, but drones that are going to be performing real commercial tasks. Drones that are going to be carrying packages. Last mile packages, maybe your prescription. Drones that be carrying massive cargo between two points of a distribution network. Drones that are going to carry people in an urban air mobility use case. The FAA estimates that by 2021, there will be 700,000 commercially operable unmanned vehicles. The number of actual unmanned vehicles is much, much larger than that. But these are the ones that are going to be doing business. So now we take our airspace picture, double the passenger traffic in the next 15 years, and now start to layer on all those drones. It gets busy really quick. The point is, the future of air traffic will be too large for the current system to safely manage the skies, and specifically, controllers themselves. These people are absolutely amazing. If we have any controllers in the audience, thank you for what you do. It, it really is amazing work. But they're disadvantaged, uh, and they're human, right? A single controller can handle between 20 and 22 simultaneous aircraft in their sector. That is not scalable, given the numbers I just showed you in terms of the expectations of air growth. So uh, I hope this works. I have an audio clip in here. This is a JFK approach controller uh, in a reasonably busy period of time. And what I want you to pay attention to is the cadence, the syntax, the sequence of communication. And in it, it's actually funny, um, she gets into an argument with a British Airways captain about something that captain um, can't do. And it's a pretty interesting little interchange. Let's see if it works. Kilo heavy, 15 kilo heavy, roger, seven miles from Zalpo, clear dial off runway, 22 left approach. Okay, yeah, uh, could be our left, 22 left, could be uh, 15 kilo. Rush all one alpha, Juliet heavy, turn left heading 280, maintain 2000. 280, maintain 2000, no shuttle one alpha, Juliet. Endeavour, F5192, turn left heading 340, descend, maintain 3000. 340, descend, maintain 3000, F5192. Final vision, 405, whiskey, descending 5000. Version 4, 5, Whiskey Heavy, heading 310, maintain 4,000. Heading 310, maintain 4,000, Version 4, 5, Whiskey. Speedbird, 15 kilo heavy, speed 180 or greater till 5 DMA. I can't do that, Mom. It can be 160 or greater till 5. Okay, you gotta give me more than 160 from now, though, so when are you gonna float to 160? Yeah, I get that, Mom, but I am flying a 747 and I have to stabilize the search criteria, which I must maintain. Okay, and you still haven't answered my question. Right? I mean, wow. Um, that happens all the time, right? And I mean, here we are, beautiful audio system. That's basically the quality of the audio that you have in the cockpit today. So these are highly trained professionals that have been doing this for many, many years and managed to keep our system really safe. So how AI is going to help airspace management? Why am I up here talking to you about this problem at Time Machine? Well, put simply, I think I've just shown you a use case that has a scale and a scope that is very challenging for the human condition to manage. This is exactly where AI comes into play. And, and specifically, if you combine machine learning and techniques like deep neural networks with scalable compute, you can start to handle a problem of this scale and scope. So what the Boeing company and Spark Cognition announced earlier this year was the formation of a joint venture called SkyGrid. 
SkyGrid is poised to use artificial intelligence to improve efficiencies to management, airspace operations, and, and ultimately safety, right? We need to scale the airspace system. We need to scale the management of that system, and safety must be primary. So fundamentally, what SkyGrid is doing is applying AI to this challenge, not just of the air traffic controllers world, but actually the full scope of operations of unmanned systems. When you start to think about fleet management, you start to think about flight planning, obstacle avoidance, the avoidance of other air traffic, planning optimum efficiencies for your network, right? Because the future, we actually see all of these drones as basically a network of Internet of Things devices. You need an operating system that's going to help you do that, and then you need to also protect that system and all of these capabilities that we get as Spark Cognition's contribution into SkyGrid um, come together with the, the background and the experience of the Boeing company to enable a new system uh, for air traffic management. So airspace awareness, flight planning, you can see how AI plugs into each one of these things. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope this has been uh, educational, if not a little bit entertaining. Uh, thanks for your time.